Uh, well, today I want to demonstrate to you what could happen to our present day reefs if we expose them to the long term over conditions that are projected to occur before the end of this century. Um, so just to talk about those conditions uh, and the ones we decided to expose our patch reefs to, we selected two. We selected the business as usual trajectory, which is where we continue to pump out CO2 uh, into the environment at an ever-increasing rate all the way through to the end of the century and is represented, if I can show you, on this blue uh, line here. So basically our fossil fuel can, uh, production continues at a huge rate. Going with this uh, scenario, there's a certain amount of CO2 that is projected to be accumulating in the environment. And you'll notice that that amount of, oops, it's not supposed to go forward yet. You'll notice that that amount of CO2 is still increasing at the end of the century. It's not abating. And to go with that is a global increase in temperature, which on average is about four degrees from present day amounts. By contrast, um, the other scenario we exposed our patch reefs to is one where we significantly do something about the CO2 that we're emitting into the environment at present and actually see a decline in that CO2 emission by mid-century or even as early as 2040 on this graph. Um, that's only a couple of years away in many respects. Um, with that, uh, we see CO2 accumulating in the atmosphere to about 550 parts per million, and we see an increase in temperature of two degrees. So to summarize the two treatments, the future treatments that we expose our patch reefs to over the one and a half years are what I refer to casually as the business as usual. It's got a, a proper name, which is called RCP 8.5 that I use in, in the figures. And if we convert the PCO2 into an anomaly, it's plus 570 ppm and plus four degrees. And then there's a reduced um, um, uh, scenario called RCP 4.5, plus 180 ppm of CO2 and plus two degrees. And then importantly, there's the present day. And this is always a stumbling block, I think, when we come to experiments, what should we expose organisms to? So my present day, or PD, is just plus zero. And we went to one location on a reef. We heard some great talks about how uh, reefs vary at very local scales. So we decided to select one location. We're fortunate that the CSRO have been logging temperature and CO2 data at this site every two hours since about uh, 2009. So we have local variation, daily variation, seasonal variation to go on. So and when you look at those uh, data, you can see that not only does PCO2 fluctuate through the season, it's much, much more CO2 in the water column in the summer than there is in the winter. Okay, as you can see, oops, I don't want that one there. As you can see here, okay, but also you see the temperature fluctuation that you would expect from this high latitude reef. From an experimental point of view, this is really nice because if we collect and establish our patch reefs in April or May, and we slowly introduce them to the plus four degrees that will go with our um, most extreme treatment, we don't end up heating the patch reefs at all. So we can circumnavigate that experimental problem of how do we actually expose them to the future without heat shocking them, because we use the reduction in the temperature to, 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 as the acclimation window through time. So our treatments essentially look like this. The green line represents present day, the yellow line represents RCP 4.5, and the red line RCP 8.5. And I've drawn a, a nice thick black line through the center, which is the maximum uh, monthly mean temperature. You know, it's the NOAA prediction, which is 23.7 for the region. Importantly, about one degree above there is when, from long-term observations, NOAA have started to say we should look for breaching. So under our red treatment, uh, um, we should expect to see bleaching in our tanks by about November. And in our yellow treatments, we should be expecting to see bleaching or at least heat stress accumulating by December. We perform these experiments in outdoor 
um, sumps, okay, they are flow through tanks. So that's nice because it allows things to recruit from what was going on in the reef. So if everything dies off, there's still the potential that other things can be in fact and start to grow within the tanks. You'll notice they've got nice pretty blue filter papers over the top of these tanks. And that's so we emulate uh, the light conditions at five meters from whence we collect all the organisms that we use to build our patch reefs. We had one first attempt of this. We ran it through summer and we published it in PNAS. And for this longer term, one and a half year experiment, it was almost two years experiment all told, okay, we used pretty much the same makeup uh, of hard corals. So we've got a cropra, branching acropora, seriotopra, hystrix, which is a needle coral, stylophora pistillata, uh, pariety slingica, plating montiparas, lobophilias, brain corals. We substituted Plachygyra for uh, goniastria, single polyp corals, fungia. So we've got a big diverse array of what we find at the site. And then we have macroalgae. We have the calcareous ones, the non-calcareous ones, and a range of invertebrates, um, um, sea cucumbers, um, and even some vertebrates such as lawn blennies to recreate our scenarios. So the experimental timeline um, is as follows. And I've put at the bottom just the present day conditions for each of those uh, segments through time. So we've got the acclimation basically starting April. We reach treatments in July. And we managed to take the experiment through two springs, two summers, and had a winter potentially for recovery because things get cooler there. Even in the hotter tanks, they get cooler at this period of time. So what's happened in this experiment? So this is the present day condition. Okay? I think this is a testament to the fact that we can maintain and we can grow corals quite well in aquaria because the corals grew phenomenally well. Um, um, most of them, I'll show you the data later, on average put on about 100% um, from where they started over the full course of the experiment. Right at the end, we had a bit of a bloom of algae in this tank. Uh, but for, apart from that, um, uh, it was a testament to the fact that we can grow corals. When we look at RCP 4.5, okay, we see a, a somewhat sad story. And so the pictures you see here, it's every month going past. So you see bleaching developing in some corals. Okay, you see death in uh, some corals. You see recovery as winter comes on. Okay, and actually it's fairly sparse in algae as well, especially as compared to some of the other tanks. And then finally, at the very end, as summer came in again, those that bleached and survived and bleach, uh, bleached again. And so for a summary of what happened through the course of time in these tanks, you can see that in December, when we expected to hit it, we did start seeing bleaching, which was a good testament to what NOAA and all those predictive powers uh, uh, have shown. We got death in many corals, you know, the Acropora, the Seriotopora, the uh, uh, Stylophora, the Montipora, the classic weaker corals bleached and died, disappeared very quickly. However, the fungi and the brain corals, the Lobophilia and the parietes hung in there for an awful, uh, for a long period of time and made a recovery, so they didn't uh, die. So uh, to summarize what we saw in this treatment from the Plachygyra is white, bone white, not a sosanthelli present, back to pigmentation, and then we start to see them bleaching again through the course of time. When it comes to RCP 8.5, the business as usual, the story is, oops, sorry. The story is much sadder. So as we went through time, we saw bleaching. We started to see bleaching in September we, uh, uh, for some of the species, mainly in November. We saw cyanobacteria by the end of summer. We see a change of algae as we go through winter, and we head back into the cyanobacterial uh, reef, which is relatively depressing uh, type of reef to look at. Um, it looks like there isn't much um, uh, coral living here, but I'll show you one ex exception shortly. So essentially what we saw here was by September, November, we started to see bleaching. 
Funnily enough, some of the more robust corals in RCP 4.5 started bleaching relatively earlier, in fact, earlier than some of those that died uh, immediately in RC RCP 4.5. So the brain corals, the fungia, okay? The fungia hung in for a long period of time, okay? They survived all the way through to April, and then they gave way as the cyanobacteria built up. So by the end, we had no apparent living coral, but then at the end, we pull apart the tanks and we have a look to see what we can find. And this is a, an Aptasia, an aquarium uh, coral, basically, um, growing on a sea cucumber. And we had hundreds of these things. We were going to count them, and by the time we got to, 100, uh, to 500 in each of these tanks, we gave up counting and we just put a plus after it. The fish also did relatively well in these tanks, so we didn't see any immediate impacts on the fish uh, that we had put into the tanks. So when it comes to what the big process is, how did they get affected in the tank? In the early experiment we did over the summer, we didn't really see a treatment effect on things like photosynthesis. And this is the photosynthesis to respiration ratio that I'm showing here. So irrespective of treatment, what you can see here is that there's a seasonal trend. Okay, it's, high, oops, it's higher um, in the winter than it is in the summer. When you explore this further, when you explore this further, what you find out is that that is driven by really high respiration rates in the summer. And that's not surprising. We find high CO2 in the water column in summer, and this almost justifies that high CO2 that we see in the water column in summer as being principally driven by uh, respiration, the metabolism. When we look at the effects of treatment on the O2 flux, however, we surprisingly, well, I don't know from an algal point of view if this is surprising, we see the P to R ratio much greater under RCP 8.5. And if you remember, for the most part, those tanks are covered in uh, cyanobacteria or algae through much of the course as compared to the corals. When we looked at dark respiration, it was also slightly reduced in that uh, experiment, but not significantly. And I think this tells me that productivity isn't the best measure for reef health, okay? I think the cyanobacterial uh, reef isn't a good reef, but its productivity through, is through the sky. So what happens with calcification? This is, the, uh, uh, in, oh, this is the impact that I think is most important because partly why we performed this experiment is we wanted to see how long the reef framework is going to be able to stick around under these conditions. And so I've broken up this figure into three parts. So the early part of the experiment, which is uh, the winter through the first spring, the summer through to the next winter, and then the next winter. And at the moment, we're just going through to the second uh, uh, November because I don't have all the data for January and February and March in, in as yet. So you can see in the present day tanks, calcification just went through the sky. It just increased the volume of coral, everything increased, so it's not surprising that we see this. But the sad story is that under either future scenario, that is simply not the case. Okay, neither of them are growing, neither of them are calcifying. Okay, potentially a little bit more calcification and growth under RCP 4.5 than 8.5. Uh, and this is the part, despite the fact that some of the corals managed to survive through that window. We looked at night uh, versus day calcification rates. We saw, and it's perhaps not surprising given how many of the corals disappear, dramatic drops in the daytime calcification rate. But equally, like we saw in our previous summer experiment, we see a dramatic increase in the rate of nighttime calcification throughout the whole of the experiment. If we wanted to look specifically at the coral calcification, the previous data just showed you what happens uh, to the patch reef. So that includes calcification by things like halamida, what's going on in the sediments. So we wanted to isolate what was happening to the corals. We do this by buoyant weighing them through time and seeing how the buoyant weight changes because this represents what is happening to the calcareous uh, material in the coral. Again, I've segregated this into a beginning through to March. 
a march through to the second march, and then a beginning through to, uh, through to the end, which is the collective response. For the present day, uh, in blue, yellow is the RCP 4.5, and red is the 8.5. And what you can see is we've got nil calcification occurring right from the beginning of the experiment through to the end of this experiment. If we break this down into what happens to specific corals, so I've selected Montipra, okay, because it was one of the plating corals that bleached and died very quickly, okay, across all of our tanks in both of the future um, uh, environments. Okay, what you can see here is we got huge growth. That we saw that picture for the plating Montipra under present day, but no growth whatsoever. Our measurements, when we weigh them, we weigh at the end, we keep the dead ones. We don't stop weighing them when they've died because we want to know how long the reef matrix is going to survive. And actually, I think this is quite an underestimate of what happens to the reef matrix under these conditions because these plates of coral with all their algae on them, they're very sticky. They accumulate sediment and you can't shake it, out. I'm sorry, you can't shake it off the coral. Also, a lot of these fragments, when they die, they get buried in the sediments and you lose them, they fragment, and then we don't include them because we can't find all the parts and it's not fair to include them into the measurements. So we want to go on and investigate what happens to these fragile cor corals. Are they actually more fragile as they appear to be in these treatments? The other corals we wanted, I wanted to show you the response was for these fungia, these single polyp corals. They bleached, they were remarkably resilient, even in RCP 8.5, even though they finally succumbed to death um, late on. Okay. What you can see here is that the bleached um, uh, uh, fungia actually grows relatively well okay, in its bleached state. By contrast, the bleached platyjara didn't grow at all. And so just because one bleaches one survives and bleaches again, you, get very, you still get very different responses amongst them. And clearly, one aspect that is keeping these corals going through the exper experiment is the fact that they are feeding. And the, there's the benefit of the experiment where we have a patch reef, because we can, they're introduced with food, they've got flow through food going through them all the time. So we did a little sub-experiment where we pulled um, uh, nubbins of Platyjara out, and we um, uh, gave them, uh, uh, we supplemented some of them with Artemia, and we didn't supplement others with Artemia. And we just measured the change oops, in total organic carbon, okay, in, in the water column around them. And we found that when we didn't feed them, they actually emitted more carbon to the water column than when we fed them. And that's principally probably because they're getting nitrogen as well as carbon and the carbon's useful to them. And when they don't get uh, the nitrogen, okay, they just emit the carbon as mucus. And potentially much of what the photosynthetic organism, the dinoflagellates are giving them is actually just directly distributed to the reef ecology. So to conclude, I just want to give you the net response that we observed. Okay, basically under 4.5 we saw a bleaching and recovery in some corals. We saw that productivity was really high. Okay, we saw calcification however was nil to non-existent uh, even under those reduced scenarios. Um, when we pushed it to 8.5 we got bleaching, we got death in all corals, but the soft uh, aptasia, the, the pests, we had productivity high, we had actually negative calcification through the course of the experiment. This seems to me that say, even tightening our belt to 4.5 might not be sufficient unless there's major adaptation or mitigation steps that occur to reefs in the interim over the next, what is only 80 years in retrospect for these conditions to obtain. So what we want to do for the future is we're going to take all these um, uh, calcium carbonate um, uh, skeletons that we've produced for the experiment. We want to uh, subject them to structural testing. We want to see how weak they are. And we want to start thinking about constructing models of how long reefs can actually maintain 
um, their frameworks through the course of time. So thank you.